Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Steve Usden, Washington Editor. Stephen Hansen, Associate Editor. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. On today's pod, a tale of two neurology companies. How Lundbeck has evolved under CEO Deborah Dunsire. And how Biogen could acquire its way into being a near-term growth company. Plus, President Biden is building a case for bolstering biomanufacturing. And Nora Volkoff, director of NIH's NIDA, in conversation with Editor-in-Chief Simone Fishburne. But first... Today's podcast is brought to you by the BioCentury Bay Helix East-West Biopharma Summit. It's scheduled for November 14th through 16th in Redwood City, California. That's in the San Francisco Bay Area. There will also be two bonus days of virtual one-to-one partnering meetings. This VIP event brings together U.S., European, and Asian biotech executives to debate globalization strategies. You can register to attend on our website, biocentryeastwest.com. We hope to see you soon at the summit. All righty, 70 years or so into its story, Lundbeck has been breaking from its classical psychiatry small molecule focus to take on a more innovation-focused R&D strategy. Lauren, what brought about this shift? Well, as you mentioned, I think it started with the new CEO joining. And when she came on, she set out on a path to sort of revamp the pipeline. And that was through both restructuring the internal development and going externally more. Uh, We haven't seen a a ton of acquisitions or major R&D partnerships for, for Lundbeck over the past few years. But in terms of what brought it on, I think the changing appetite for neurology innovation is a big part of it too. We had very established drugs, especially in neuropsych, that worked relatively well and companies could continue selling these and and growing. And I think there's been a lot of innovation in this field. There's been an increased investor appetite and there are more biotechs that are working on new science. So I think in order to sort of stay relevant, the field is changing. And so the pharmas have to change as well. I think it's interesting, you spoke to Johan Lutman, the EVP of R&D, and he, of course, was one of the new executives that Deborah Dunsa brought in. And he's, I suppose, partly or largely in charge of revamping the pipeline. And he himself kind of said, look, everybody thinks or used to think about Lundbeck as a pretty sleepy, I don't think he used the word sleepy, but a not very exciting neuro company. And I think now, really, he can make the case. I mean, they have a lot of sort of innovative mechanisms in their pipeline, some of which are brought in and some of which are homegrown. You can talk about that. And I think another thing that he's done that is really important is to terminate a number of programs as well. So pipeline pruning is is always a big deal. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about how they've moved to the sort of innovative angle with the first in class emphasis in their philosophy. Yeah. So we saw over the past four years, we've seen six new programs added to the pipeline and six were dropped. So that's, you know, a huge percentage of of this company's pipeline. Of the new programs, all except for one are potential first in class. So by our definition, that means that there is nothing on the market against the same target using the same modality. I think in these cases, there's nothing on the market for any of these targets. So the pipeline as it's structured now is focused on, they've sort of split it into four mechanistic classes. There are the neuropeptides and hormone signaling, protein aggregation, which is things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, neuronal circuitry, and neuroinflammation, which was completely new for Lundbeck. So that's sort of bridging neuroscience and autoimmunity. So MS, um, I think is one area of focus. So Lauren, um, do you have a sense of how much of the ongoing pipeline is homegrown, like what they've got in the preclinical arena 
versus how much they're going to be leaning on business development. Because I think what my understanding from your very interesting interview conversation with them is they sort of really want to tell biotechs, or sorry, biotechs in the neurospace, hey, we are open for business. We would like to partner with you. Um, is that correct? I think it's correct. We haven't seen a ton of deals even over the past four years, but they have acquired two companies. There were a couple recent interesting R&D partnerships. One was with April Bio, which is what brought them into the neuroinflammation space. But he, he sort of said, keep your eyes out for more deals with biotechs coming forward. So I actually don't have a great sense of what's in the preclinical pipeline and, and how that breaks down. So far, a lot of what's in the clinical pipeline has actually come from external innovation, from what I can tell, despite the fact that there have been only a few deals in the past few years. And of course, Deborah Dunsire joined in 2018 and really one of the highest profile women in biopharma today. So we'll keep watching Lundbeck and her leadership there. It's uh, been a cool story. I When I first got into biotech 20 years ago or so, I found Lundbeck maybe a little bit stodgy, but it's exciting to see what they're working on. And uh, who knows what's next for them in the partnering space. All right, let's turn to Biogen. The company recently successfully navigated one of its biggest binary events with phase three Alzheimer data. And now it finds itself at something of a crossroads. Yes, Stephen, can you break that down for us? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeff. So as you mentioned, um, we covered this, I think, three weeks ago on the podcast, the positive phase three data for lecanemab, which was sort of one of the biggest catalysts of the year for the sector, um, and also one of the most unsure of, but it did show positive data. And I think it kind of leaves Biogen in a interesting position um, in that they are now potentially, you know, getting ready to to launch uh, an Alzheimer's therapy with a full approval rather than potentially accelerated approval. But it also sort of leaves them with uh, not much else in the cupboard. If you look at um, what they have in their portfolio across their MS franchises, Spinraza, and their biosimilars pipeline, out of 13 commercialized products, only one of them has shown growth in the second quarter of 2022 of more than 5%. That's Vumerity, their, their MS product. And even that only brought in $136.8 million. So we're only talking less than 7% of their 2Q22 sales. So they're in this position where they have a declining revenue stream and what looks to be, at least in the near term, you know, just one single potential growth product in uh, Lacanumab. Stephen, obviously the lecanemab data have given them, I don't know if it's the lease of life or an extension or however you want to think about it, in that if it was negative, it would have been disastrous. How much do you think that that really plays into, I mean, Biogen was kind of, is kind of in trouble in all events. And I, I think people look at it as a little bit of a beleaguered company. So how much do you think the lecanemab data and the potential for that product really makes a difference to their future. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes a huge difference because even with the positive data, I think that there are still several challenges that they're going to have to navigate here. I mean, first of all, is sort of convincing payers and uh, you know physicians that the data that they generated is clinically meaningful. I think that's the first step. And then not only do they have to get full approval, but then they have to be able to convince CMS to change their NCD on anti-amyloid MABs which I don't know that that's necessarily a given. And even if you presume that then that there is then a successful launch, that they're able to learn from the disastrous launch of Aduhelm, that still really only leaves them with a single growth driver. And so at least in my conversations with several buy-siders, they really thought that you know, Biogen needs to consider using their, as of late at least, increased stock price and, and some of their cash and, and debt potential to see if they can acquire you know, another growth driver to pair with it. And that's sort of what I was trying to get at, which is that even if everything went swimmingly, as good as it possibly could mm -hmm. with lecanemab, they still have a hill to climb. 
So walk us through, you write that they've got 5.9 billion in cash, 7.3 billion in outstanding debt, and they could take on another four and a half billion dollars in debt that would give them an equity to debt ratio of one X, right? That's what you've written in your very nice article about it. And that would give them about over $10 billion to work with is how you've positioned this, right? That's right. Now, you also gave us a healthy lift of targets. You've done that business development scouting for them, Stephen. <laughs> so that amount of money, how realistic is it for them with that money to get a company that could fundamentally put them on a safer tracking? Is that the right amount of money? Sure. I kind of broke it down into two different categories that investors called out. So there's either sort of the bolt-on acquisition, which you're adding one or two programs, or you have sort of a more transformational deal where you're taking on either a pipeline or you know an entirely different franchise. The most popular names, I think the ones that everyone's kind of looking at now uh, on the bolt-on side are either Karuna, which had positive phase three data for a new mechanism in schizophrenia in August. Intracellular, which has seen pretty good uptick in their sales of their um, of their schizophrenia and bipolar depression product, and Neurocrine. Those are kind of the three primary names that kind of keep coming up in discussions around biogen in, in the neurology space. I think the issue is, and if you're saying that they have about $10 billion to play with, obviously the thing that could change here is if, if an, uh, a target is willing to take stock, you know, that can obviously change change the ratio there. But it means that Karuna with about a $7 billion market cap, Neurocrine is close to $11 billion. If you're adding on a healthy sort of takeout premium for them, makes a deal for either of those potentially, you know, challenging to do. So intracellular kind of looks like the most feasible in that sense. But it's also maybe the one that makes potentially the least impact on, on the top line. So then you start thinking about transformational deals. And this is where I think it could be interesting. I mean, I don't know. I hadn't heard before these conversations with some investors, hadn't really heard a lot of chatter about UCB as a potential option. Let me just interrupt and ask, when you say a transformational deal, are you talking about a deal that would take them out of neuroscience? To some degree, yes. But I guess I'm also meaning a, a larger deal with a larger organization where you might face more challenges of integrating the two companies. So like, for instance, the big difference between a company like Karuna, right, it's largely a single asset late stage. You know, you don't have any commercial infrastructure there yet. Whereas with UCB, they already have nearly $3 billion in revenues, you know, in the first half of the year, a large organization, fairly large and diverse pipelines. So yeah, you're moving them a little bit beyond Neurocrine, but I think UCB is an interesting opportunity just because, you know, they have two candidates for uh, Myasthevia Gravis, which are under review. They have some newly launched programs, for instance, one in IL-17 A and F inhibitor that could potentially be a best-in-class product. So I think UCB would potentially bring a little bit more to the table in terms of providing some growth. But you know, it's also it's a two way street, right? It also depends on whether any of these companies are interested in being acquired. Well, speaking of two way streets, is it a naive question to ask if there might be a deal that goes the other way? Somebody acquiring Biogen for this asset now? It's a good question. It's, I, boy, it, I think it would be a hard for whoever would be looking to do the acquiring. I think that's a bit of a hard sell to your shareholders because right now Biogen is valued at around $40 billion. Let's say if you have a takeout premium, and even if you add not a big takeout premium, you're probably looking at closer to $50 billion, and you're acquiring a declining revenue stream with Lacanamab is really the sole bright spot. And Biogen only owns 50% of the economics for Lacanamab. It's not something they, they hold, you know, they own hold, they, they share with Esai. So to me, that's a pretty hefty price. And at least according to the buy stars I spoke to, they, they think that that's too steep of a price for an acquirer to really be able to make that work. So just one note, if they did buy UCB from my own very personal perspective of what is a farmer and what is a biotech farmer for me, having been sort of born hundreds of years ago, or at least before the birth of biotech with the, in let's call it the 70s or 80s or whatever. So UCB is an old company. So this would be in a kind of interesting one where you've got a, you know, a big biotech biogen buying a, an older, more established company, UCB, and that, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, I think maturation it's, of the sector, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's 
one I haven't heard batted around a little bit, but I think it's it's an interesting. And I mean, they're also partners on one of uh, they've got a phase three program for uh, lupus that they're partners on, which I mean, we'll see that. I think they're still uh, at least a year and a half, two years out on seeing data from that. But yeah, I, I think that, I, I just think Biogen's in a really interesting position here. And and the other complicating factor we didn't even mention is the fact that, you know, their CEO is on the way out. They haven't uh, officially appointed a new CEO yet. So that's also the wrinkle here is, you know, what can Biogen even do um, before they have some permanent leadership in place? Yeah. I, I just find it quite interesting because you often see this with a lot of other biotechs where when they're launching their first drug or there's a high profile drug, their stock price, you know, is quite volatile based on weekly reports of what the uptake is for for that drug or what the quarterly sales figures are relative to consensus. And I think if Biogen doesn't add another growth driver, they're potentially just putting themselves in this position to where their perception and their valuation by investors could be pretty volatile if everything is hyper focused on on that lacanumab launch. All righty, thanks for that, Stephen and Lauren. Let's turn to Washington, where the Biden administration has launched an initiative intended to compensate for decades of underinvestment in and complacency about the nation's biomanufacturing capacity. Steve, you've been digging into this. What did you find? It was interesting. I went into it skeptically, and I spoke with a number of people who I thought would be skeptical about it, senior people in the the White House, um, CEOs of companies that are involved in biomanufacturing, people who have been leaders of government agencies. And they all said, no, it's don't be so skeptical about it. This actually could lead to something that would be important. Basically, the idea is that the United States leads the world in discovery and development of biopharmaceuticals. You can look at those as two legs on a stool. The third leg is manufacturing, and the United States has basically ceded uh, a lot of leadership in manufacturing to other countries. And w- we would be better off if we got some of that back here, not just for biopharmaceuticals, but for a whole range of products that are going to be, I would say, kind of bio-enabled, you know, synthetic biology products, products in agriculture, products and materials. So the initiative launched with an announcement that the government was going to reallocate $2 billion from its current uh, appropriation, mostly for biomanufacturing. A lot of people would look at that and say, that's not Terribly impressive. Look, one company, uh, National Resilience, which is dedicated to uh, biomanufacturing. It's an arch company, uh, as several other prominent investors also. And they've already raised $1.4 billion just themselves. I spoke with the CEO of uh, Resilience, Rahul Singhvi, and he said, look, this could be like the CHIPS Act, which is what Congress recently passed that invested $54 billion in semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. He said that with an executive order and a lot of people who said kind of blah, it's not going to really be anything. And look what happened. And then I spoke with people at OSTP, Matt Hepburn, who was the number two person at Operation Warp Speed in their vaccines program and now is running pandemic preparedness at the Office of Science, Technology, Policy in the White House. And he said, look, it's an old fashioned idea to think that government has to fund programs 100 percent, that there's a lot that it can do to catalyze programs that it can make things happen that wouldn't have happened on their own by investing relatively modest amounts of money. And he gave some examples, which I have in the story. So there's some optimism about it. And there's a sense also that this is kind of a time when people in administration and people in Congress are really attuned to this issue for a variety of reasons. One is the supply chain vulnerabilities that were exposed by COVID-19. Another is competition from China. Uh, and a third is the success of Operation Warp Speed that showed that it is possible for the United States government to intervene in a way that helps companies do things that they might not have been able to do or to do things that they might have been able to do, but to do them a lot faster. All right. Thanks for that, Steve. Staying with Washington, Simone, uh, last week, Nora Volkoff, director of NIH's National Institute on Drug Abuse joined you on the BioCentury show. She was 
optimistic. I was a bit surprised given the raging fentanyl epidemic in cities such as San Francisco, just up the road from me. But she was very optimistic about the direction of research and treatment of addiction disorders. Tell us a little bit about your conversation with her on the BioCentury show. Yeah, so it's, it is interesting because Nora spent a lot of time, Dr. Volkov spent a lot of time talking about all the terrible things going on and all the hurdles. And yet throughout that, and at the end, when I said to her, so, you know, let's end on a good note, she's well, very optimistic. So, you know, I think one of the issues is she brings up a lot of hurdles in the field of drug abuse and addiction and substance use disorder, which are not new. And I think people have the tendency to sort of go, yeah, yeah, big problem. Let's move on, do something else, can't do anything about it. You know, the stigma remains, there's still a big stigma. Um, it's not maybe what it used to be. I think the scientific community now completely accept that or largely accept that addiction and use disorders, you know, disorders of, of substance abuse are biological, they're diseases, there are changes that take place in the brain. But still, you know, she says, societally, people don't value addiction as a disease as high as they do others. And for me, one of the biggest issues is you have this massive public health crisis, which is much bigger right now in terms of the number of people dying every day than is the pandemic. And we do not see biotechs jumping in in the same way, even in remotely the same way. And I know Steve knows some, I mean, there are some valiant biotechs who've been in this field and battling it for years. And they will say that many of the issues that Dr. Volkov talked about are not new ones. I mean, one of them, a big one that she raised is reimbursement. So even if you create a drug and you go the distance and you do the trials and you get it approved, you can't get it reimbursed. Well, um, I, I, I want to jump in. You know, the thing that I found uh, interesting and optimistic about what she said in a way, it's different from a lot of the things that we cover at BioCentury because the solutions are, are in our hands, right? Right. It's not like this is something that's extraordinarily difficult and we have no clue on what the biology is or what to do. There are solutions that society could take tomorrow that would make an enormous difference. And they would start, as you said, with increasing reimbursement. I've spoken with the CEOs of companies that are involved in abuse disorder, and they said, look, you have a drug that a cancer drug that extends life by um, six weeks, and you can get six figures for it. But if you have a drug that will save people's lives from opioid overdoses, there's a great deal of resistance to paying, you know, a thousand dollars a month for it. So that's something that could and should change. Probably it could change by using population-based models for payment uh, rather than paying by volume because there's so many people that need to be treated. And the other is, you know, obviously there needs to be different settings for um, where care is giving and care needs to be considered holistically. Not, it's not just giving somebody a pill. That's not going to, that's not going to do it. And that was one of the other areas where it sort of spills into the optimism. So first of all, she says that she has been in touch with folks in FDA and in the government sort of saying, look, you guys came together for COVID, are there ways that we can come together, public-private partnerships, learnings from that? But she also talked about two particularly interesting things. One is that during the pandemic, they were forced to use virtual technologies. And she thinks that this could, I don't know if I can go with game changer, but she thinks it could be a, make a significant difference to recruitment for clinical trials, which is very difficult normally. And to your point, Steve, it's sort of going to find patients or individuals in the communities where they are rather than creating the hurdles of trying to get people into major medical centers for clinical trials. So she was um, quite upbeat, actually, about the potential for those kind of technologies to make a difference. And then, of course, the biology that you referred to before. There have been a lot of advances, she said. So even though there's not a lot of solutions currently being put forward on the treatment side or on the reimbursement side, biology is marching ahead. She says there's a lot of new targets because, you know, most of the drugs that are used right now are new formulations or versions of very, very old drugs that work via dopaminergic or monoaminergic systems. But now there's orexin pathways, 
and glutamatergic, glutamate-based pathways. And we did take a look at compounds in development. There are actually, for such a big public health disorder, we found under 10 compounds in development via new targets for addiction treatment, different versions of addiction treatment. But that said, there are some pretty interesting things out there. And, you know, that coverage is on our website. And the interview with Dr. Volkov is available, free with registration, which Jeff can tell you. Yeah, you can find that at thebiocenturyshow.com. Yeah, it's a great interview. Um, it's one well worth watching. So take a moment to register and check it out. The interview is enabled by our sponsor, Sofanova Investments and the BioCentury Bay Helix East West Summit. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Our friends at Kendall Square Orchestra provide the music for our podcasts. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. 